Please stand for the gospel reading. Today's scripture is from Luke 16, 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that I, when I am some, um, dismissed, as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Excuse me. And make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master co commended his, the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful is a very, in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of the Lord. Glory so today we have another one of those hard sayings of Jesus. Hard, especially if we're addicted to our wealth and consumption-driven economy. For those who would like the Christian faith to have nothing to say about economic matters, the text is really a problem. Jesus has a lot to say about economics and the economically advantaged found that the people who are advantaged in his time found irritating. We would do well to listen, even if we are challenged. One of those cartoons which sticks with me over the years is from the New Yorker of a very posh couple. She's in her furs and jewelry, and he's in the perfect suit, and they're leaving this big church. And she says to him, he does so well, it's so hard to preach the gospel without offending folks like us. <laughs> yes, it is hard to preach the gospel without offense. But we're not here to be offensive, but rather it's an invitation for us to look at how money and possessions and financial security in general take precedence in our worldviews, our daily lives, and our spiritualities. The fact is that while most of us aren't really terribly wealthy by American standards, well, we all have funds. And by the world's measure, we're all doing pretty well. Because Jesus has a lot to say to us about the abuse of wealth, as did the prophets. We all take our possessions and money seriously. We guard our financial security. A lot of us 
have incomes which have not kept up, kept up with the cost of living over the past 40 years. There are pressures of student loan debt, housing costs that are too much for too many people. Statistically, we Americans have high debts and low savings rates, and mostly a lot of us live from check to check, and all this is a source of great stress. In the course of things, I think that we find ourselves asking if we live to work and pay bills, or if we work and pay bills to live. The place of work and financial obligation seems to have taken center stage bit by bit in our lives. Compared to other industrialized countries, we, we take far less vacation time, we work longer hours, we take our work home far more, we have fewer holidays and time for family. We never seem to have enough money and it eats away at our souls. Where 60 years ago many households got by with one worker's single income today, many households only get by with two workers and those with more than one job. How many of us find working double shifts hard hours, rarely seeing our spouses and all for too little money? Now, there are political explanations for these developments, and yet that's not my focus here. There are spiritual needs that we need to take a look at. Because 2,000 year ago, years ago in Palestine, the economic forces were grinding down the poor. More and more people fell into abject poverty, and Jesus saw it and named it and invited people to place God first instead of money. He invited them and us to get off that roller coaster of work for diminishing returns by being wise about our financial dealings and clear about our priorities. I've long had questions about why would Jesus commend this dishonest employee who uses his position to shortchange the boss for his own benefit? I mean, that's really what he's done here. It's a classic case of corruption, isn't it? But Jesus was appealing to a heck of a lot of people who were being abused by the economic system. They would have heard him and they would have chuckled and paid closer attention. These are people who are already living in the alternative economy of the day. Today, across the country, a lot of people are in a similar situation. Some vote Republican, some vote Democrat, some don't vote at all. Some are struggling to survive, others are just frustrated that they want to blow things up. Jesus has a word for them. But Jesus was not ideological. He wasn't a socialist, he wasn't a capitalist, he wasn't an ist of any kind. Jesus just talked about first the frustration and anger that people feel in these circumstances. And he doesn't moralize against all those who are struggling in various ways to survive. He tells us to survive in a hard economy, to be wise and creative as well. He certainly knew that hard work was not enough. How could we as a church support wise and creative living, especially for those being consumed by the economy? How could we help direct wealth toward building a better life for all? How can we think outside the box enough to make a difference for members of the community who are hurting? But you see, in addition to this, once Jesus has their attention, he goes deeper. And he poses this question, who are we serving, God or money? One way to look at it might be this. If I serve God over money, will I be more generous with others, both financially and otherwise? If I serve God first, what would I be like? If I serve money, will I measure everything in terms of financial benefit? 
Another way might be to ask how much time and focus and energy we reserve for family, friends, and prayer over work and the daily grind. Or are we consumed by our work? Are we more concerned about our to save for retirement or how we serve the community in which God has placed us? Do we complain about those who use social services? Or we do, do we take part in making the lives of others better? Do you, we use our financial and economic positions to help people? Or to make ourselves richer? As we look at our week, how much time and attention do we give to God on a daily and a weekly basis? Is God an afterthought or an add-on? Is God at the heart of life? Is our spiritual condition the highest priority or no priority at all? These are hard questions for our culture. They may not be the burning question on your heart this morning. But I think they nag us at the wee hours of the morning. They nag us when we encounter others who are different from us and have needs and we're not there for them. What is it that we are called to do by Jesus? How is it that we're to put God first? How is it that you put God first? I'm not here to give you a list of precise things that you have to do. It's not my place. But we have to ask this question. How is it that we are living so that God is first and not our stuff? And not our material possessions, not our money and our financial security. <clears throat> it has bearing, of course, of course, on the climate situation, doesn't it? We keep, uh, keep building the wealth of those who own the fossil fuel industry. There are a few jobs for some workers. Wall Street's happy. But the planet's going to tank and take us all down, starting with the poor, on the marginalized, those people living at, at sea level. Does it matter? I think Jesus is telling us it matters. It's not that we have to get out of the capitalist system. It's not that we have to adopt a particular political perspective. It is an invitation to put God first. And what does God ask? What does God ask? Jesus has asked that and he gives a simple answer or someone tells him that answer. We know what that is, isn't it? To love the Lord your God with your whole being and to love your neighbor as yourself. Could we do that? This is a text which we skip over because it's annoying. We don't want Jesus to talk about this stuff. We don't want Jesus to criticize the main operation. Lately I've been reading a lot of the prophets. And over and over again the prophets are called by God to tell the people of God that they're spending all their energy on something besides God. They're getting rich, they're exploiting the poor, and God's getting to the point at which God will say, okay, there are going to be consequences for this. He allows the consequences to happen, and yet God always comes back and says, but I love you. I want you to return to me. I want you to live in my love. Everyone is invited into that love. Everyone is invited into the heart of God and to share that love with others. Take a look at how you view money. Some of us in this room are living 
on borrowed time, borrowed money. Some of us are living on not enough resources to begin with. Some have more. Some have just enough. It's not a criticism of your income. It's a question about your soul. 